So hazard tree assessment is the process of evaluating the likelihood that all or part of a tree will fail. And by when I say it'll fail, I mean it'll fall, hit the ground or hit something on its way to the ground and cause damage and or injury. If there's no target, there's no hazard. And arborists, they perform tree risk assessments for three principal reasons. You do it to enhance public safety, you do it to protect workers on the job site, and you do it to promote tree longevity by predicting and preventing tree structural failure. There are certain things you should look for when you're on the job, even if you're not hired to do an assessment for hazard. There are certain red flags that you should be aware of that could indicate that the tree has a higher likelihood of falling down in the future. And that's risk assessment in landscape management work. First thing you have to do is you have to consider the failure potential, the likelihood that an entire tree or part of a tree will break and fall in a certain period of time. That's called the failure potential component. If the tree doesn't have uh, co-dominant leaders, like Laura showed you, if it doesn't have girdling roots, like she showed you, if it doesn't have a lot of defects, then it has a low failure potential. If it has a lot of defects, then it has higher failure potential. Second factor is targets. There has to be people or property that could be damaged, injured, or killed if the tree fails. There's no target, there's no hazard. Tree stability can be affected by a lot of things. You could plant a perfect tree, but things can happen that will cause the tree to become less perfect over time. There can be construction nearby, near the tree. Grade changes, there could be trenching near the tree, trenching, destroying, damaging the tree's roots. Removal of adjacent trees, uh, trees that previously had served as a barrier, uh, replacement of sidewalks and root loss, failure of nearby trees, and changes in wind dynamics, including increased wind speed from storms. And it's a well-observed fact that storms, high wind conditions, cause most tree failures. They may not happen during the storm. A lot of times they happen after the storm. And a lot of times people don't connect the storm with the tree failing later on. It happens during the storm or after the storm as a direct result. Let me digress to a personal note. I live in Fort Lauderdale. I, since I'm a wood type of guy, I live in an old wooden structure, an old wood, I call it an old wooden shack in the northeast corner of Fort Lauderdale. It's 70 years old, built out of pine, mostly. And I could tell you a whole nother story about Formosan subterranean termites and a whole nother story about dry wood termites, but I'll save that for another time. But this is a picture that a neighbor of mine took of the front of my house in the summer. I think it was in August of 2005. And I had lots of shade trees. In addition to liking wood structures and old wood, I like to have trees. Uh, there's a black sapote tree on the right-hand side shading the front of the house. There's a tamarind tree on the left-hand side shading the other side of the house. There are two live oak trees, both of which were planted in the 1930s by the original owner of the house. Trunk diameters of 28 and 29 inches in, uh, in order, uh, shading the uh, southeast corner of the house. A big old mango tree, had the best tasting mangoes in the world in the east side of the house. Uh, really nice. Uh, this is in August of 05. In um, October of 05, my wife and I took a long planned trip to visit friends in Atlanta, Georgia. And we couldn't get home when it was time to come home. Do you remember anything that happened here in October of 05? Do you remember anything that happened on October the 24th of 2005? We couldn't get an airplane from Atlanta to Fort Lauderdale. The Fort Lauderdale airport was closed. We ended up flying to Sarasota. And my brother, who lives there, picked us up and drove us home. And when we drove down my street, couldn't get in the front door. I had to call an arborist friend of mine. Luckily, I'm in the line of business where I know a lot of arborists. And he came right over with a chainsaw. And I was able to cut a hole so I can get in my front door. In those years, my son still lived in Fort Lauderdale. And he came and he closed the shutters so that none of the branches broke through the windows. The live oaks fell. Everything fell. Um, I had a $6,200 bill to remove 
fallen trees from the roof of my house and fallen trees from the roof of my workshop out in the backyard. There's the crane. They had to use a crane. The, I, I hired Maltby out of, uh, out of Boston. They were doing work up in Pensacola. They were recommended to me by Way Hoyt. And they had the whole thing cleaned up in four hours using a crane. Not too many arborists in South Florida use cranes, but they use them. Uh, and you have never seen a happier guy in your life than the crew chief of an arborist uh, crew who's working with a crane. You can see that orange thing in his ear, that's the radio. He gets to talk to the crane operator, and he gets to go up in the air, and he has his chainsaw and a separate tether, and he has a thing that can weigh the different branches, and he, he, could, he was cutting a thousand pound pieces at a time, and then craning them up, up over the house. Oh, there's what used to be a mango tree fell on my workshop, and a crane them up back onto the street where his associates would cut up the pieces into uh, smaller pieces. I had enough firewood for five years. I'm still burning the last of that oak firewood in my fireplace. And his associate gets the piece and cuts it. My uh, next door neighbor, when I was in Atlanta, called me to tell me that my house didn't fall down but all the trees did. My neighbor has hurricane glass. He doesn't have shutters like I have. He watched the whole thing. He said, our neighborhood was safe until a microburst came through. The sky turned green. The wind got really loud like a train. And he could see the trees spinning. His trees and my trees were spinning counterclockwise before they fell. They were picked up by microbursts and dropped. None of my trees had co-dominant leaders. <laughs> None of my trees had columns of decay. None of my trees had girdling roots. <laughs> My neighbors didn't either, and they all fell. If there is a high wind condition that has your name on it, and it's coming right at you, all bets are off. In the background, you can see some of my neighbors had big live oak trees. Well, the microburst didn't hit them. You can look at an aerial of my neighborhood, and you can track the microburst based on where the fallen trees were. In high wind conditions, if they're accompanied by microbursts, which look like tornadoes, but the government doesn't call them tornadoes because it affects insurance ability, um, then it, it just doesn't work. Here's a famous picture on the internet showing a school bus that was crushed by a tree. Uh, I first saw that uh, as an internet picture. My friend Ed Gilman showed it to me, he found it on the internet. and at Co coincidentally, two summers ago, I was doing a horticultural assessment consulting job on the island of Dominica in the Eastern Caribbean. I visited their botanical garden, and that's the home of the school bus that was crushed by a baobab tree. Uh, there were no kids in the bus at the time. The bus was put next to that building because they knew there was a hurricane coming, and they figured that the building would protect the bus. They didn't look to see that there was a baobab tree that had a trunk diameter of 42 inches that uh, disagreed with the wind and fell over on it. So remember this, storms cause most tree failures, either during the storm or after the storm because the tree has been weakened. In order to determine the likelihood of a tree to fall after being put under that kind of stress, tree inspections are, are done. Visual tree assessment is the official word, uh, phrase, that the uh, International Society of Arboriculture uses. It involves a thorough systematic inspection, walking completely around the tree. If you're hired to do a hazard tree assessment, this is where you start, visual tree assessment. And you include uh, examining the, uh, the buttress, examining the roots, examining the root flare, examining every part of the tree that's visible. And you look to see, is there a dieback? in the crown? Are there gaps? Is there discoloration in the foliage? Is the tree leaning? Are there individual branches that extend beyond the others in the crown? Does the tree have good taper? That is, does the trunk diameter decrease as you go higher up off the ground? Some landscape trees have terrible trunk taper. The diameter up high is the same as the diameter at the base. Trees that have good trunk taper tapering, less diameter as you go higher, they have a tendency to be more able to bend in the wind than trees that have no trunk taper. 
You look to see if there's abnormalities in the trunk, the root collar, or the root zone, especially girdling roots. So as you go up in the canopy, the trunk diameter should be smaller. With a lot of trees that are saved by developers, sometimes if they were in a grove of trees, sometimes the inner trees and groves don't have good trunk taper because they were protected by wind, from the wind, by, the, by their neighbor trees. You should always check diameters of trees to get an idea of whether they're more likely to bend. Think about a fishing pole. If you go fishing, the best kind of fishing pole to have if you get a bite is one that has a smaller diameter at the tip than it has at the base because that allows the fishing pole to bend when there's under stress. The stress is the fish pulling on the bait. If you had a fishing pole that had the same diameter at the base as it does at the tip, and you had a big, strong fish, it would be more likely to break the pole, wouldn't it? It's the same thing in a tree. Taper is a good thing to have. If you don't see taper in a tree, that's a potential danger sign. You look for co-dominant leaders. Laura showed you all about co-dominant leaders. But this is a separate stem here and a separate stem there, and there's no connective wood there. I used to make my students do dissections of smaller trees with co-dominant leaders just to illustrate to them um, you know, what it means to have no connective wood. This is one of the dissections. This is a smaller tree. Here's the stem, and here's the beginning of a co-dominant leader and the beginning of another co-dominant leader. And you see that pucker right in there? If you look down from above, you can see that there's, here's the bark all around this stem. And here's the bark all around this stem. And those two stems, the bark, the exterior barks are touching, but there's no connective wood. As that tree grows and increases its diameter, the end pieces get heavier, and it creates stress, and a little bit of wind comes along and knocks it off. And in landscapes, it's very commonplace to see trees that have been damaged by one or more of the co-dominant leaders failing. There's a picture I took, I forget where, of what happened when one of the co-dominant leaders sheared off and fell. It's a fresh picture. There's a picture of Laura when she was a graduate student. Didn't she look happy? Um, she was happy because I called in sick that day and I, she didn't think I'd be the professor that day. But um, she's standing next to a tree that has a big strip taken out of it where a co-dominant leader had fallen off a few years earlier. And all of this part of the trunk of the tree is being decayed now. And some of that decay was going all the way through. What do you think the likelihood of that tree falling again is going to be? With all that decay inside the trunk, it's not going to last much longer. And I notice I made her stand on the side. I didn't make her stand behind it. When I had my wife posing for pictures, I had her stand differently. But with, with valuable students, you always want to have them stand to the side so if the tree falls, they can say, oh, it went past me. So co-dominant leaders, they're very prone to, to splitting. And that's why in the Florida grades and standards, co-dominant leaders are a downgrading factor. And you're selecting trees for a landscape, you're asked, whoops, to, to avoid trees that look like this. When they're little, they're no big deal. But as they get bigger and bigger and bigger and the trunk diameter increases, that's a lot of stress and a lot of load. And some, you see these in landscapes everywhere. I was with my wife at a college graduation up north, and I said, look at that. And she said, oh, it's a cute little kid. I said, oh, I don't mean the kid. I look, that's a co-dominant leader there. I should go tell the kid to get off the tree. And she said, my wife said, don't do it. I said, why not? She said, parents will call the cops. You're not supposed to talk to other people's kids. But I worry about kids doing things like this. The reason the little kid was sitting there is there was a college graduation ceremony down there and she wanted to be able to see. People do things like this without thinking and their parents don't even think that it could be hazardous. But look at that virtual absence of connective wood there. If this was me sitting up there, that would definitely fall and break, <laughs> or break and fall. A little light kid might, might survive better. 